Life sure zooms by, doesn't it? You know, I was thinking of this a couple of weeks ago. I was watching a hummingbird flit around in our yard, and he was taking little sips from the Turk's cap that grows under our pecan trees, and it dawned on me I hadn't put our hummingbird feeders out this year. A whole year had gone by. I say it every spring. I'm going to put the hummingbird feeders out, and, and then all of a sudden it's October, November, and the time for hummingbirds is over. The hummingbirds are migrating south, right? Another year has passed. So much that didn't get done. So many projects, so much work that gets put on hold because we're just busy and time flies by. Welcome back to Bible Study Online here at St. Paul. Sorry, it's been a couple of weeks since I've been able to post uh, a study. Uh, we're starting a new series, though, over the next month, a month and a half, that's going to be entitled Everyday Object Lessons for Adults. Simple reminders, simple lessons that are meant to be devotional in nature, to remind us of who we are as God's people and, and what kinds of work we are to be about. And so today I want to start with Ephesians chapter 5, 5 verse 15 and 16, where the Apostle Paul urges us, he says, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Now, you know, this verse, it gets me every time. Like I had mentioned earlier, it's amazing how quickly a day can go by, and there's so many ways that we could make better use of our time. So many ways that we could use the minutes and seconds and hours of each and every day to glorify the Lord, to do things that are, are useful and, and bear fruit for His kingdom. And boy, it's not just the hours and, and seconds and, and minutes of every day. It's, it's the weeks and months of each year, too. I mean, here we are at Advent again. And while Advent is a time of preparation for Christmas, for me, it's always a time to look back and, and just see how much time has passed and how many things didn't get accomplished. And I'm sure for a lot of you, as it is for me, too, our, our, our weeks and months are, are starting to get scheduled already for the new year ahead. It just kind of seems to be a vicious cycle. And so Paul says we should make the best use of our time. And you know, I don't think that Paul's just simply talking about better time management. I mean, you can read Stephen Covey's uh, book or, or any, any number of, of self-help books and improvement books on, on how we can be better time managers. No, rather, I think whenever you get an imperative like this in Scripture, it's, it's good to to zoom out a little bit and take a, a, a look at, at the bigger picture. What is the author trying to say throughout the whole book leading up to the specific verses you're studying? And when you do this with the book of Ephesians, you see that in the first three chapters of Ephesians, you get this, this beautiful, almost indescribable picture that, that Paul paints for us of, of who we are as God's people. I mean, in a, the book of Ephesians, it, we're told first and foremost that we're God's chosen people. We are people who were dead, but, but have been made alive, right? Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in our trespasses, but God, being full of grace, has made us alive in Christ Jesus. It is by grace you have been saved, through faith, not by your own works. It's a gift. Paul goes on to say that we are heirs, uh, uh, awaiting an incredible inheritance, that we are literally, through the church, literally the display of God's grace to all the powers that be. That even the powers of Satan, their minds are boggled at the way that God is saving sinners like us, making us his own. I mean, really and truly, the, the, the breath, the width, the breath, the height of, of God's grace that Paul describes in Ephesians is breathtaking. But then, in chapter 4, verse 1, there's this dramatic shift. Right, where chapters 1 through 3 have been very descriptive, describing who we are as God's people, describing the, the beauty of God's grace, the, the, the height and breadth and depth of God's grace. In chapter 4, Paul then goes on to 
instruct us in what kind of lives we are to live, right? Because of who we are, because of what God has done, this is who we are to be. Paul says in chapter four, verse one, he says, I therefore urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you have received. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling. That sounds very similar to, to chapter five, verse 15 that we read earlier. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time. Paul urges us to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, worthy of the calling that we've received. And of course, Paul will then go on to talk all about how we are to relate to one another as Christians in marriage, husbands and wives, uh, parents and children, even slaves and, and, and their masters. You know, how, are we, how are we to relate to one another as children of God, all of us? Uh, and what does that mean for our relationships? What does that mean for our conduct? And of course, Paul isn't here saying that, that this is what makes us children of God. No, in one sense, he's reminding us already, he has already told us in chapters one through three that the pressure's off. We're not having to check off boxes or, or make a passing grade like in a high school calculus class or anything like that. No, God has already done this. God has saved us in Jesus Christ. He's made us alive, saved us from, from sin and death, and now we are free to be the people of God. But in another sense, you could say that this also means that the pressure is on. I mean, it's not that I have to earn my salvation, but if I'm a child of God, I really want my life to mean something. Don't you? I mean, isn't that kind of uh, the whole point? What's the point of being a Christian if it doesn't bring any change to your life? I, I want to do things for the Lord. I, I want to live in a, a manner that's worthy of the calling I've received, in a manner worthy of the gospel. It's, it's not... It's not me checking off boxes. It's not me making a passing grade to get into heaven. It's just me simply being filled with joy at the fact that God has done so much for me and me looking for ways to, to live that out, to share that with the world around me. And maybe that's then what can be so disconcerting when you get to the end of another year like we are at the end of 2020 and you look back, you look back at the, the months that, that have already passed, January through November, and you find yourself wondering, what have I done? How have I made the, the, the best use of that time? You know, God has worked through time and eternity to save me. How have I used the last 10 months or 11 months to glorify him? I mean, obviously, it can be so easy to get wearied and tired of the nonstop, in-your-face pace of our our modern world, all the data overload of social media, the instant access go, go, go of our society and our culture. We truly do live in a time where people are yearning for significance. I mean, despite all the connection that we can have via the internet, all the information at our disposal, people feel more disconnected than ever. Our nation is more divided than ever. And so the Apostle Paul here just spills the beans then, spills all the marbles and says, then go and do something about it. Go make the most of the time given you. Live life like a, a high school football coach who's, who's trying to psych up his team before the big game. We've got a job to do, a mission to complete. So walk in a wise way, not in an unwise way. Make the most use of your time. Now, of course, that word time, that, that too is a significant one here. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, it's a significant word throughout Scripture. You see, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. I'm sure most of you know that. And in the Greek language, there's two significant words for time, at least two words that are used in Scripture. One is chronos, time, and the other is kairos, time. Now, of course, chronos is, is the most common of the two words, okay? That's the most everyday way to talk about time. That's literally the tick-tock of the clock, the passing of seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years and decades. You know, just the fact that one day rolls over into another. It's time for bed. It's time to eat lunch. You know, chronos time. It's the kind of time that stresses us out too, right? It's time to get to work. I've got a lot to do. It's going to take a lot of time to get all this work done. But you know what? That's not the word that Paul uses here. And in a lot of cases in the scriptures, that's not the word that's used, just regular time. Now, there's another very special word, kairos, like I mentioned, that that is used. 
often in the New Testament and certainly used here. And Kairos time is very different from Kronos time. Kairos time isn't measured in, in seconds or minutes or hours or weeks. Kairos time is, is significant time. It's not measured in, in minutes or hours or, or days or weeks. It's, well, it's those moments in life that just simply seem to stand still, those extra special moments cram-packed with meaning. It's the, 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 the second right before the buzzer goes off in the big basketball game, and, and your team has the ball, and, and one of the players puts it up in the air right at that last second, and, and the ball just sort of seems, seems to hang there in the air, right? And everyone gasps, wondering, is it going to go in? Are we going to tie the game, or are we going to lose the game? That's Kairos time, that moment of, of anticipation, that moment of, of hesitation, that moment of excitement. Kairos time is, well, it's, it's that extra special moment when a man and a woman stand up at the altar, you know, and pledge their life and their love to one another in holy matrimony. You know, it's, it, it's a moment that they're going to remember for the rest of their life, not literal seconds and minutes, but just the experience, the sight of seeing one another there, of beholding one another, putting that ring on their fingers, all of those precious memories. Kairos time, it's... Well, it's, the, it's that experience that a, a man has for the first time or a woman um, when their first child is born, you know? And, and I remember when my kids were born. I, I don't remember how you know, long the experience was. I just remember the rush of emotion when, when I got to hold my baby girl or one of my sons in my arms and, and cut the umbilical cord and hear them cry for the first time. It's Kairos moments, special moments, cram-packed moments with purpose and significance and meaning. And in the Bible, that word then is used to often describe God's timing, God's way of working in the world. God's work, which never seems to conform to our expectations, never happens on our timeline. And yet when it happens, when God works, when God accomplishes his will, it's always special. It's always meaningful. It's always impactful. And it always changes things. And Paul is saying that that time is right now for you and me. That God is giving us every single day to make the most of it. To fill it with meaningful things. Things that that further his kingdom. Things that that help us work out our vocation as his children. That's what we've been called to. I mean, this is truly what we mean on Sunday mornings right before worship when we say that this is the day the Lord has made and we all respond with, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whether it's been a bad day so far or a good day, we recognize that it's still a day that's been given us from the Lord and and the Lord gives nothing without purpose and without a plan, without his good and gracious will And so we make the most of every day as God's people, or at least that's our prayer. That's the way we desire to walk. And so look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. For the days are short and the times are evil, Paul says. In fact, he goes on to say that, verse 17, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And you know, maybe this is where sometimes the older we get, it, it becomes harder and harder for us to, to do this. You know, when you're, when you're young, you're optimistic. You're, you're excited about uh, new opportunities and what each day holds. And, and the older you get, sometimes the more cynical you get, right? You, you think you've seen it all before. And it's easy to, to lose some of the joy, some of the excitement of simply being a child of God and getting to do the work of the Lord. We can be so disenchanted sometimes, too, with this world, right? You know, things don't turn out the way we want them to. Elections don't always go the way we want them to. Our leaders don't always make the best decisions. Our families don't always make the best decisions. Our friends, you know, and it can be easy to, to find ourselves disappointed, find ourselves uncaring, unsympathetic, uncom- incompassionate, uncompassionate, um, 
And of course, then too, you see all the problems in the world. I mean, you know, we see marriages end, right? Friends, their marriage splits and it makes everything awkward. Or, or in the family, some kind of drama happens that causes hard feelings. Or our health declines or the health of a loved one. Or we lose our job or our spouse is depressed. or So many things, so many troubles, so many problems, so much brokenness. And well, through it all, it can be easy to lose the joy to lose sense of time, real time, God's time, and what he's made us for in the first place. And so hopefully the hummingbird today can help you and me remember to be a little more intentional. You probably won't see a hummingbird for several months. (laughs) They don't usually come back until springtime, but when you do, may you and I remember to be intentional about each and every day not to allow ourselves to be overcome by the stresses of this world and lose sight of who God has made us to be, his children, his witnesses. May God open our eyes to see all the ways that we can be useful, not only to him, but but to our neighbor. May we be aware, be aware of how quickly moments pass, how quickly people pass too, friendships, Uh, Even the lives of loved ones, right? I mean, every day with with our grandparents, every day with an elderly member of our congregation is a precious gift. May this moment right now, this next moment, the moment a few minutes from now, may may we be mindful, taking time, if nothing else, to simply get down on our knees and and say a few prayers. call, Call out to God. Ask that his will be done. May the hummingbird remind us of that today that God has placed each moment before us and that each moment is full of significance. Whether it's changing your toddler's diaper or lending a listening ear to a neighbor who's down and out, whether it's encouraging your spouse after a long, hard day at work or sharing a bit of wisdom with, with a friend or a colleague, whether it's helping out a stranger who you know needs a little gas money, whatever it is, may God help us see how precious time is and may we never let a moment go may we make the most of this gift amen we'll see you next time